greatest explosion of our time, 500 times more powerful than the first atom bomb, rips apart a majestic mountain and sends a cloud of dust circling the globe. In minutes, 150 square miles of mountains with all the forests, lakes, rivers, and all their inhabitants died. This film will take you on a journey from the roaring crater's edge to that astonishing instant when the mountain literally came apart and through the aftermath of nature's incredible fury and raw power. Keep her on the fire. Keep her on the fire. Beautiful Mount St. Helens, America's Fuji, they called her. But just a child as volcanoes go, only 2,500 years old and still growing and acting up. Indian legends from time immemorial refer to her as Keeper of the Fire and Fire Mountain, and for good reason. She has been erupting regularly every 100 years or so for the past 700 years. Geologic evidence indicates that during the last 4,500 years, Mount St. Helens has been the most frequently and violently active volcano in the 48 adjacent states. The reawakening on March 27th did not surprise scientists. What we're seeing now is an eruption of steam and other gases bringing up ash, which is pulverized rock from deep within the volcano. These eruptions are being caused by gases from magma beneath the earth rising toward the surface. This is the most active period I've seen the volcano indulge in yet. The awesome power of volcanoes has fascinated men since the beginning of time. This time though, they came with a technology to look more closely than ever before. But there's still no substitute for being there on foot. Above the tree line, the scattered dusting of ash grew thicker with each step. Frozen into the snow, the ash looked like hardened spilled cement and provided good footing. But with the warming sun, it began to melt and form muddy runoffs that made strange gurgling noises. Running mud on top of steep frozen snow like this quickly made it impossible to climb. This mud is going to really slow us down, Brian. We have to zigzag our way up, try and stay on the clean snow. The slope got steeper, and each step became more painful. But suddenly the mountain shuddered with a rolling series of quivers that made them stop and hang on. The blast came without sound. Then the roar came. The dark billowing plumes turned red in the setting sun and boiled angrily out of the mountain. They stood horrified by the raw power, but managed to stifle the urge to run. did, however, quickly agree to go no further and dug in for the night. Yeah, you hear that junk? Because it was supposed to have been a simple climb of five or six hours, they did not bring anything more than a single sleeping bag for emergency only. The three of them shared that bag and their own body heat on that icy ledge a mile and a half above sea level. The mountain shook a lot, and it was a cold, windy night. No one slept much. With daybreak, their spirits surged and they lost their fears of the demon mountain. Yeah, let's go. The 
the last few hundred feet was smeared with ash. And in the morning cold, it remained frozen like concrete and provided excellent footing. The slope flattened somewhat, and they quickened their pace, hoping the summit was close. The ash on top was surprisingly dry and badly cratered by rock and ice. The scene stunned them. It was like suddenly walking onto the moon, except the thin air and high altitude made them walk like they had lead feet. They hesitated at the mile-long crack just below the summit. The magnitude of force at work here was staggering. Hey, Andy! You see this crack? all the way over here, so. Firm, like beach sand, the ash was more than three feet deep. But it was gray and without life. While they were worrying about the crack, an eruption began deep inside the crater. It started with a faint drone, and as the plume grew, the sound grew louder, too. They saw the plume rise, they were momentarily panicked, but stifled the urge to turn and run. They'd come too far for that. So they sucked in some air and followed that irresistible impulse to go and peer down into the crater. Fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Unreal. There was a constant crash of falling rock face to face with the awesome display of power was an instantly humbling encounter. was crumbling along the entire half-mile-wide crater rim and sliding into the throat of the volcano, being thrown back as fine ash. Back up a little. The rumble grew louder, and they could make out the sound of rock avalanches. And it ended as abruptly as it began. And a stillness came upon the mountain. It was an uneasy stillness that screamed at them to get out of there quickly. And they agreed without speaking it was time to get off the mountain. They left in awed silence. These eruptions continued with increasing frequency and violence, and the curious came from near and far to see one of nature's rarest displays of raw power. St. Helens is in the chain of volcanoes called the Ring of Fire that circles the Pacific Ocean. 80% of the world's volcanoes are located around this ring. 
The ocean floor, a complex of interlocking rocky slabs or plates, is slowly expanding as new lava rises to the surface through crustal fractures and pushes the plate toward the continents. The plate is forced under the continents where it sinks and is partially remelted into molten rock called magma. Under immense pressure, this molten rock seeks the easiest way up, which is usually under dormant volcanoes where channels or cracks exist from previous eruptions. The tremendous heat of the rising magma creates high pressure gases and steam. The trapped gases force the north summit to swell into a bulge more than 400 feet high. Flying over the mountain moments before the eruption, geologists Keith and Dorothy Stoffel noted melting glaciers and wet, sweating rocks. Ominous signs of heat were evident in the black, wet areas around the goat rock. A reddish debris flow appeared like a dirty wound. Otherwise, everything looked strangely peaceful at 8.30 this Sunday morning, especially the forest below the mountain and Harry's Lodge by Spirit Lake. Then, as they turned for a final pass over the summit, they noticed dust. As they approached, they could see the south face of the crater breaking up and sliding into the hole. Then the massive north side of the summit began to churn and ripple as though the mountain was liquefying in place. Within seconds, the entire north side began to slide down in one gigantic mass. It was 8.32 a.m. The airplane had to dive and turn to escape the blast. On the west side, ham radio operator Ty Kearney saw the blast envelop the north side in seconds. Eight miles due north, graduate student Keith Ronholm saw the mountain disintegrate and turn into a cloud of death that churned out of the mountain with hurricane speed. This superheated pyroclastic cloud of shattered rock dust leveled everything in its path for 150 square miles. Deadly gases and sharp-edged silica rock particles with temperatures over 1,000 degrees combined to form a fearsome inferno of death and destruction that rolled out over the surrounding mountains and forests for more than 16 miles. More than 70 people, miles from the mountain, perished without warning. Cataclysmic eruption at 8.32 was totally unexpected. Three events occurred simultaneously. A huge slide removed the bulge and sent it down the right side of the picture. A vertical explosion started on the top. And finally, the goat rock exploded horizontally. The slide, the vertical blast, the horizontal blast. The roar from this blast was heard all the way into Canada, nearly 200 miles away. Century-old glaciers melted into instant torrents of ash and mud and roared down the mountain in a rolling wall of incredible fury. Dense liquid traveled at speeds up to 50 miles per hour. A muffled drone rolled down the mountain with the torrents of mud, as though it took the sound of the eruption along with it. Rolling through log storage yards, the mud picked up logs for battering rams that helped destroy bridges and take out other trees. More log yards, more logs. Finally, the river was choked with logs and debris. 50 miles away, the fury was spent. 
but the thick debris-laden mud continued to spread, oozing into homes and backyards. And last night about midnight, the water started coming up about six, eight inches every 15 minutes. And uh, then we were back there in that driveway and watched the wall of mud coming down his driveway all the way up to here. Entire farms disappeared under the oozing mess. Carried by the wind from the sea, the great plumes of ash that shot up 12 miles into the sky drifted east. The upper layers reached Boston a week later and went on to circle the globe. Like a rolling blanket of fog, the lower layers silently crossed the Cascades. Traffic on the great interstate highways slowed to a crawl. Visibility plunged toward zero in the middle of a sunny day. Accidents mounted, and the clouds of ash kept coming all day long. Spinning wheels churned the accumulated ash into blinding clouds. Finally, all interstate highways were closed from Washington to Montana and Idaho. The air became unbreathable without gas masks. The ash clogged air filters and damaged engines and quickly inspired a flock of outlandish air filters. Airports were closed down in the three-state area, and even little crop dusters could no longer fly. You know, I woke up this morning, much to my surprise, the whole world was gray before my eyes. I thought I was dreaming, so I pinched my toe. was the middle of May, this stuff can't be snow. In many areas, like Ellensburg, Washington, more than 150 miles from the mountain, the sun disappeared behind the advancing clouds and darkness came in the middle of the day. Street lights came on automatically with the rain of ash. Traffic caught on the streets quickly scurried home. But even in the dark, men began to fight back. This vehicle was leaving Ellensburg in the afternoon of May 18th. The battle against the ash went on for weeks as people recovered from the initial shock and began the monumental cleanup. I used to think, used to think it was bad before, yeah, but now I'm sweeping ash off my floor out the door. Farms in the path of the ash fall were staggered by the gray ash. Everything from haystacks to hay fields, even the cows turned gray. Should have been shining if you know what I mean. It was like a scene from a dust bowl dream. As the clouds of ash rolled across the terrain, the air was filled with a sulfur rain. That's when the people knew. Fire But the damage was much less than feared. Although some fields were badly hurt, most agricultural enterprises came out ahead. The ash turned out to be good for the soil. Even the vast fruit orchards of eastern Washington took the ash fall with little permanent damage. Farmers soon realized the value of the volcanic ash and solved the dust problem by simply disking it into the soil. Ash contained valuable soil nutrients like phosphate and potassium that led to bumper crops.
break, May 19th, revealed the once scenic upper Toodle River Valley below Spirit Lake in silent agony. Steaming riverbeds and torn smoking hills bear witness to the hellish devastation. Torrents of mud had scoured the forest valley floor down to bare rock. Giant forests lay like spilled matchsticks. The power of the volcano is etched unforgettably on these hills. This is more than 10 miles from the volcano. Fires were still burning just below Spirit Lake, which had turned into a steaming cauldron heated by debris from the blast. The lake itself was choked with logs ripped loose from the surrounding forest. An unbelievable mat of torn and broken logs almost hid the lake from view. The hot water was still steaming. The trees came from these denuded slopes. Hundreds of acres of giant evergreens vanished from the base of the still smoldering mountain. Looming out of the haze, the hulk of the once majestic mountain shows a gaping hole on the north side with more than 1,400 feet of its top blown off. The crater is more than two miles across and all of it still hot. Dante-esque steam vents and sulfuric fumes hit a new lava dome nearly 600 feet in diameter. Keeper of the fire. Lingering steam plumes over the mountain came from water dripping into the hot crater. A week later, the ash, 15 miles from the mountain, was still steaming in the light drizzle. camera only hinted at the effect of the blast. The vastness of the destruction had to be placed on a human scale. Because it was almost unbelievable, the only way to truly record the effects of this cataclysmic event was to go in and film it on foot. Giant furs were snapped and splintered. Hundreds of years of forest growth was flattened in seconds. The pyroclastic cloud fell on the forest like a giant sandblaster, stripping the trees of their branches and snapping their trunks. Unlike a blast wave, this cloud was not deflected by the ridges. Instead, it clung to the terrain like a dense fog, bowling over everything in its path. At the end of the first day, the depressing scenery took its toll. The next morning, it started to rain. A National Guard helicopter on search and rescue spotted them. Although the pilot urged them to leave with him, he said he had no authority to turn them out of the area. They elected to stay and finish the job. The mind reels at the fury unleashed on this forest. Even the vegetation on the forest floor was stripped and incinerated. death cloud spared nothing. It unraveled this metal culvert. This utter destruction was inflicted by the advancing superheated cloud of pulverized rock and gas, traveling at speeds of more than 100 miles per hour. The strain of the trek shortened tempers. And they began to argue with each other. They decided it was time to leave, and they headed for the remains of Highway 504, less than a mile away.
Wait a couple seconds. You gentlemen are in violation of the state closure. You know that. Uh, my job at this time, uh, representing Escamania County Sheriff's Office, is to cite you for the violation of this area. The sheriff was unaware that they were three and a half miles outside the restricted zone. He forbade them to continue, refused to take them out, and insisted they backtrack and retrace the two-day trek. A cold front moved in with low clouds that made it impossible to see where they were going. They spent the night under a fallen tree and were showered with ash from the second great eruption on May 25th. Half blinded, they staggered on the next morning. The gooey ash and fallen trees slowed them to a crawl. The death and destruction was so complete that they never saw a single living thing or heard the sound of even a bird. A total and deadly silence ruled the scene. In 10 hours, they made two miles. She kept the sacred fire and she loved the river sound. Surviving in this warped landscape was different. The water was too ashy to drink, and there were no berries or food of any kind to forage. Soaked, exhausted, and freezing, they sheltered under a huge root ball. Even wood for the fire had to be dug out of the deep ash. They didn't know it, but rescue was only a few hours away. It was a primeval and awesome devastation, rendered without malice or mercy. Some survived to tell their story. More than 70 others were not so lucky. Harry Truman's Lodge used to be here. I was beer in the lake, it ain't there no more. Who got out when the mountain roared? And the grand old man who took his stand is now walking through the mountains of the Savior's land. Mother Nature took her toll. She's the one still in control. And after the photographers will come the loggers and builders and the planters of trees. For the human spirit is indestructible. And out of the ashes, man will rebuild, even as the mountain rebuilds. Keeper of the fire. Was the 18th day in the month of May when the mountain started shaking in a serious way? The Fujiyama of the West, as it was named. The young would never be the same. Fourteen hundred feet of rock blew itself right off the top. That's when the people knew. 